My apologies for my voice, which will be coming in and out, uh, frequent coughings, uh, perhaps the sound of uh, throat lozenges bobbling around in my mouth might come through. Uh, we're going to fight through this, though, and we'll see how it comes out on the other side. <laughs> I, will, I will, by the Lord's grace, handle the word rightly. It just might sound awful, I, you know, physically. <laughs> well, let's not, let's hope not. Before we do that, please pray with me. Father, before we look at Hebrews 4, we ask for your help in reading, understanding, discerning, and putting into practice your word. Do that through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. Let your word take deep root inside of us. Let it work on our consciences. Let it encourage us and strengthen us and convict us in every area that we need encouragement, strength, and conviction. May you use your word tonight to richly bless us who seek to be more like Christ, for we ask this in his name. Amen. I think we'll start in verse 1 because that's a good place to start, I've been told. So we will do that, and this is a warning that's being repeated, and we've talked about this in the previous portions of Hebrews, that this is talking about Christ is greater, Jesus is greater. If I had to summarize Hebrews, it is Jesus is greater. Christ is greater. He is superior. He is equal to God because he is God. And he is greater, greater than the angels, greater than Moses, greater than the prophets. Jesus is simply greater. And if Jesus is greater, you don't want to miss what he has to say. Right? Maybe somebody has rushed home and go, oh, I got to watch the, uh, there's going to be a State of the Union address and I got to hear what the president says. So you rush home because you got to hear what he has to say, right? Well, this is on a much greater level than that, far greater. If Jesus is the greatest of all, if he is the creator of all creation, then you should want to know what he says and should also not just want to know what he says, pay attention to it. And this is, a, this is where we start out with in Hebrews 4 as a warning to do just that, to not... To not miss out on what Jesus is saying and offering, which is true rest. So it says this in Hebrews 4, verse 1, Therefore, meaning everything that we've said up to this point, now applied. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For the good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So this is carrying on from Hebrews 3, talking about the unbelief that kept the generation that left Egypt out of the promised land. They benefited by being carried along and carried out of bondage in Egypt, but they never entered the promised land. They never entered God's promised rest. And that is because unbelief, which seems crazy when you think about all the things that they themselves witnessed. And it just goes to show you that people can see all kinds of signs and wonders and miracles, but that is not what changes someone from unbelief to belief. That is not the, the key factor. If it was, then everyone who went through the Exodus would have seen the manna, would have seen the Red Sea parted, would have seen so many miracles of God, water from rocks. Are you kidding me? All the, all the things that God poured out on curses on the Egyptians to get them to release them in the first place. They all would have had faith if it was merely brought about by miracles, signs, and wonders. This is a, a promise of entering God's rest by faith. And not having faith is unbelief. And that will make you fall short or make you miss out on God's true rest. This is a rest that is God's rest. That's why he calls it my rest. It's my rest. It's a different kind of rest than any other kind of rest. I've had some pretty good naps in my lifetime. But any, even the best nap I've ever had does not compare to the rest that is God's rest. He calls it his rest because it's a perfect kind of rest. It covers all the bases. It's not just a physical rest of a tired body. It's rest from a tiredness 
a, a weariness of working for one's own salvation, a promise of being taken care of, protected, provided for in a forever heavenly place. John Owen described, he's an old Puritan, described some features of rest for a believer. Rest means peace with God. Rest means freedom from servitude to sin. Rest means deliverance from the burdens of the Mosaic observances. You don't need to know how many pigeons to sacrifice on the third Saturday of the fifth month. Thank the Lord. Rest means that it's the rest that God himself enjoys. This place of rest is so wonderful that it should concern us if anyone comes short of it. It isn't enough to almost enter God's rest. That is the worst possible place to be, is to come close to God's rest, but not enter it. To know of it, but not be a partaker in it, would be the worst position to be in. Better to be the person who knows not of it, for you don't know what you're missing. These people are the people that we find in Matthew seven twenty one. Those who profess Jesus as Lord, Lord, yet Jesus tells them bluntly, I don't know you. We never had a relationship. And casts them away, calling them workers of iniquity or wickedness. We don't want to come close. We don't want to come short. We want to be in God's rest. For indeed, the gospel that is preached brings that when it is received. Hearing God's word isn't enough. You must receive it. Yes? Because you can preach the gospel to somebody, but if they don't receive it, if they don't believe it, they remain in their unbelief and will not enter into God's rest. All the people in ancient Israel heard the truth of God, but did not believe it. Not all of them. All of ancient Israel saw the miracles and the wonders that God did, heard God through his prophets, but yet did not listen. It didn't profit them a thing because ultimately they didn't receive what they saw and what they heard. So you can see and you can hear, but that's only step one. You have to have the other part, which is receiving it and believing it. Hearing gives opportunity but it's only a profitable opportunity if you take that opportunity and mix it with faith and belief. And that's something that some people who are filling pews today need to hear. That they hear, they hear the word, they hear the gospel, they hear about God, they're around the things of God all the time. However, to this day, they have not taken that what they have heard and placed true belief and faith in it. So as close as they are to the rest of God, they are outside of it. Because you can't be inside God's rest if you do not have faith and believe. You think of the joy that Israel had in coming out of Egypt and coming close to the promised land. I mean, how exciting, especially after 40 years in the desert. Oh, how exciting. You think of how much joy but then you think of just how many were buried in that desert. An entire generation. A, a, an awesome promise that was made, but never grasped. It is the same with God's gospel today. An awesome promise that is there for the taking, but never grasped. You can't just know God's gospel. You can't just know God's word. You can't just know that God is. You can't just know that Jesus is. That is not enough. It is insufficient to just leave it there. It has to have faith. The idea here is that like the ancient Israelites who left Egypt, they had received God's message through the preaching of God's word. Some received it and found rest. Others rejected it in unbelief and found death. It is the same to those that the writer in Hebrews is talking to in his time, and it's the same for us today. Verse 3. 
For we who have believed entered that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken on the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. The, the rest for God's people, those who believe, those who accept what they hear and believe and put their faith in God and in what he has said, enter into rest. And that rest is like God's rest. This is in contrast to the previously mentioned ones who did not enter into God's rest. So unbelief keeps you out of God's rest. Faith brings you into God's rest. We enter. We who have believed enter that rest. That's the difference. An unbeliever will not get that rest. that, That rest has been provided for and made since the foundation of the world. That's what those verses are saying. That there's a rest, God's rest. And it has been provided since the foundation of the world. And those who don't believe in that will never see it. But those who do believe in it will see it and enter into that rest. That rest that that, that is like God's rest, finished work. A finished work. When he says, ah, it is good. It's God's rest. His finished work of creation was done long before Israel came out of Egypt, long before David was writing his Psalms. Yet he speaks of his rest, meaning that God is still bringing people into it. And unfortunately, there are people who are still rejecting it as well. In a certain place, it reminds us of ancient scrolls that were somewhere unwieldy and specific passages were not precisely cited according to more tools and chapters of the verse, this is talking about God's seventh day of rest. His day of rest to show in his power and that everything was done perfectly and he rested. We get to share in that same kind of rest when we have faith in what he has said and the one who has said it. Verse six. Since therefore it remains for some to enter in it, And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterwards in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. You remember that from our Psalms Bible study, 95? Psalm 95. The day to accept and believe, not tomorrow, Today, that is the day to accept. Don't be like the stubborn Israelites who rejected in unbelief and did not have faith and lost the opportunity to have rest and peace with God. Instead, take advantage. When you hear God's truth and you hear his gospel preached, the time to take advantage is today if you hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts. Verse eight. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. God did not make a place of rest in vain. People did enter into that rest, but there were those who failed to enter and it was because of disobedience. Today, if you hear his voice, that appeal that we saw in Psalm 95, there is a rest. And it's an appeal to do it today, to be in that fulfilled promise that God makes today. There is a rest for the people of God. There is a rest that is spiritual. Why is Joshua brought up here? Well, it reminds us that the name Jesus is the same as Joshua. The second Joshua will finish what the first Joshua left unfinished. The first Joshua brought the people into the promised land of rest. It was a foreshadowing of the second Joshua, Jesus, bringing all of his people into perfect rest in heaven. That's why he's mentioned here. And again, it also fits in with the fact that Jesus is greater because Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is greater than the prophets. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than Joshua. 
It's also pointing to the fact that this rest is also found in a person, Jesus. That he's the key to that rest. I don't know who said this, but I like this saying. If you meet a troubled, crying child and try and comfort them by giving them ideas and logic, you give them the idea of rest and peace using logic and ideas. It doesn't do much good. But when mommy comes, the child is happy again. It's the same idea. Try and, try and explain rest and peace any other way, but then when Jesus comes and actually draws you to it and brings you there himself, oh, we will be happy. So God's rest is an opportunity that remains open as long as you are alive. As long as you are alive, the time has not passed. It is not yet too late. But God had offered this to people in the past and they rejected it and they did not enter into his rest. So you get the idea, this is God really setting forth this opportunity and the writer of Hebrews, God is using them to highlight this. Hey, Jesus is greater. Jesus has offered you the gospel of Jesus Christ and it is an opportunity for rest. Don't be like the Israelites who yet being taken out of Egypt, rejected God, found themselves in the desert and died in unbelief, finding no rest in spite of being around all these godly things. God's true rest comes through Jesus and no one else. Jesus is greater. Verse 10. Another really important point comes in verse 10. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his work as God did from his. Oh, this is so important. Oh, this is so important because so many people, even, even people who profess to be Christians, have the idea that there is some part of their work that earns them heaven, i.e. rest. And so the idea here of rest is to not continue on in works. And it doesn't just mean in perpetuity in heaven. It's talking about how once Jesus has saved you, you can have the rest of knowing that you don't have to work for your own salvation because God has provided it for you. It doesn't mean you no longer do works because you do do works. You just do them out of love for Christ, not out of some kind of desire to make it to heaven through your works. So you finally find rest from all your efforts to try and save yourself through your own works. That is, a, that is a type of rest that you can enjoy right here and now. Knowing that, ah, I can finally rest. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. You will find rest. The rest that he's talking about there isn't just a, a relaxation night on your barca lounger. He's talking about you no longer have to worry about working for your salvation. Because Christ has done the work for you. Now the works you do aren't for your salvation. They're to show and glorify Christ and to tell others of Christ. It is, it is for his glory, not for your salvation that, that you do works. So you, you and I have ceased from doing works, at least in the sense of earning our salvation. You now know you don't have to earn your salvation. Jesus has earned it for you. If you put your faith and trust and belief in that and in him. No longer needing to work. Not meaning that you're no longer able or willing or having to do good works. It means that there is no longer any place for works as a base of our own righteousness or salvation. What wonderful news. The shackles come off and now it's kind of like when, when people understand for the first time that you, how to give biblically. No, you give cheerfully. And there's many ways to give. And when people finally understand biblically the idea of giving, it's like shackles fall off. Now when you give, oh, it's joyous. It's not a duty as much as it's a joy. Life has more joy. That's the kind of joy we're going to have in serving God perfectly in heaven for all eternity too. 
We're going to love it because it's going to just be perfect for us. Whatever he's made for us to do in heaven for all eternity, we are going to love it. It's going to be perfect for you and perfect for me. So it's not, the, the idea is that there's no longer any place for works as a basis of our righteousness or our salvation. That's what this is talking about. It's not saying, hey, stop doing good works. Hey, stop being obedient to God's word. No, it's not saying that. It's the gospel, the real gospel, putting faith in the work of Christ for our salvation and righteousness instead of our own. We rely solely on the work of Christ. Uh, many times you'll meet people and you'll say, hey, are you, how do you feel about heaven? Well, do you know where you're going to go? Where you die? Well, I hope I've done enough. Good. As soon as somebody says that, boom. You have an opportunity and a, and a duty to share the true gospel with them so that they have the blessed assurance because they don't understand the true gospel at that point. They've given it away. They have just tipped their hat. And they might be the most loving, beautiful person on the planet and that you have to explain to them that that's not how the gospel works in a very loving, gracious way. And believe me, if God is in their heart, they're going to rejoice when they hear the truth. Sensation from works is a base of, as a basis for our righteousness is the idea of the Sabbath rest. God rested from his work on the original Sabbath in Genesis 2 because the work was finished. You now can rest from your work because it is finished. The work of you having to work for your salvation or your entrance into heaven and God's rest is done. It is finished. Christ finished it for you on the cross. These next few verses are going to be emphasizing accountability. There is an accountability that comes to those who have heard the word of God. It is the word that must be believed and obeyed. And it is what people will be judged against, whether they are obedient or disobedient. This is basically going to be what the next couple of verses are about. Starting in verse 11. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Yeah, I'd say so, yes. Hey, let's try and enter that rest. Yes, we should strive for it. Effort. You're not just going to sit back and let it fall in your... And you're going to strive for it so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Referencing again the ancient Israelites. Let us therefore... This is... Uh, you, you must apply this truth. That's what it's saying. Let us therefore... You must apply this truth that we're talking about. Work hard and strive, be diligent to enter this rest that I'm talking about. God will not force that rest upon you. You must enter it. The rest is entered by faith. It's not a passive kind of faith, though. It is an active kind of faith. You rely on Jesus, not passively, actively. You trust in Jesus' work for your salvation and your righteousness, not passively, but actively. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. If you're not active in that reliance upon Christ, in faith and belief, if you're not active in doing that, the result will be disaster. That person will fall according to the same example of disobedience. You don't want to be like the children of Israel in the wilderness. So close to everything, hearing about all these promises, perhaps even assuming that all those promises are yours, and then hearing the Lord say, Oh, depart from me. I never knew you. Verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And let and no creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Oof. Can't get around God's word. Best tool in the world. Perfect for a perfect sword, which is good for offense and defense. It's the word of God that diagnoses the condition of man perfectly every time. 
It takes the heart and lays it wide open and discerns with perfect accuracy the spiritual health of said person. In the case of those that the writer of Hebrews is addressing first, they were too ready to follow in the failure of the children of Israel. They give up active, strong, and living faith. It's living. God's word is living and powerful. When I say God's word is living, I don't mean, oh, it changes with the times. No, that's not what that means. There has been many people who have twisted that and said, oh, God's word is living. Therefore, it breathes and it adjusts and it changes and it evolves over time as culture is evolving. No, the word of God is breathed out by God who is immutable, which means he's unchanging. And therefore, everything he says and does is also unchanging just like his word. So when his word exposes our weakness, our sin, our unbelief, it demonstrates its power. It demonstrates how powerful his word is. It's constantly reminding us that we must submit to it. And when we do, we are far better off than to not submit to it. There is a ministry of God's word. It is his word. It is not just man's word on page. It is powerful. You see the workings of God's word and it attests to its genuineness by the transformed lives of millions of people since its inception till today. His word brings healing. It brings fruitfulness of the spirit. It brings healing and delivering from deliverance from sin. It cleanses us. It guides us. It counsels us. It is a source of strength. This is why we abide in it. This is why it's one of the things that John points out in 1 John that is an an, an evidence of a genuine believer, a love for God's word. It is our source of spiritual growth. It is living and powerful. It is, there is a spiritual power about God's word. And the writer of Hebrews is expressing this. And you know it because you have witnessed it and seen it and, and experienced it in your own lives. You know it is powerful. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That's talking about scripture. It's not just a storybook or a book filled with myths. It is power. And it's not, the, a, it's not a good preacher that makes the Bible come alive. The Bible's already alive. Alive with power, meaning that there's something going on here. It's an active thing. It's not just some passive book. Every other book in creation is a passive book. But the Bible is an active one. It's like it's alive. It's, it's doing something. That's, that's what it means by it's alive. It's living. Yes, because it's always doing something. God's word is always on the move. It's always acting. It's always working. It's convicting. It's encouraging. It's strengthening. It's giving wisdom. It's, it's doing all those things. The Bible is alive. It's not the preacher that makes it alive. It's already alive. And it is powerful. You can have something that's alive, but it's, but it's weak. It's living and powerful. You can have something that's alive, but it's weak. It's meh, wee. You know, hey, a snail is alive. Kind of weak, though. It has to be a pretty big snail for me to get worried. So there's going to be something that's alive, but it's not powerful. God's word is alive and powerful. It's active and it's powerful. Whew. I mean, it makes you look at it, at it from a totally different perspective. Like, wow, this is, a, this is the most powerful weapon in the world. And it is. That is exactly what God's word is. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Remember I said earlier about how swords are great because they're great for offense and they're great for defense. God's word is the same. It's likened here to a a sharp two-edged sword, but the sharpest of swords because it pierces even to the division of soul and spirit of joint and marrow. There's a, a... there's a blacksmithing show that I forget the title of, but one of the, they have to test. They say, hey, make this sword. Okay, and then these two guys go and they make different swords and they come back and those swords have to be tested, right? 
And so, oh, how strong is a sword? How sharp is a sword? You know, how well done is this? So all this stuff matters. And, and then when they're testing them, they have different guys do different tests. And there's one guy who he takes, his job is to take a sword and to swipe it at a pig. There's a dead pig hanging on a hook and he just takes it because pig flesh is very similar to human flesh. So it's meant to be an idea of that, right? So what he'll do is he'll stab this pig carcass, he'll slice at it, and he'll say, this sword will kill. Or he'll say, it will not kill. Like that's, that's what he says, right? So the idea is it's not sharp or it is sharp, right? And you should see this guy go, and sometimes they use other things like ice or metal or wood or bamboo. But the idea is, is that all those swords might be sharp, but they're nothing like God's word because there's no sword on earth that can divide and pierce to soul and spirit and go through joint and marrow and hit you spiritually at your very core. Only God's word can do that. Only God's word. Many times when you're preaching, people will say, that message was relevant to my life. Or they'll say, you know, was my wife talking to you because what your message was today? Uh, those kinds of things. It's not that the preacher has secret information. It's not that the preacher knows something that you don't want him to know ahead of time. It has nothing to do with that. That conviction, that message that seems so relevant to the moment or to that life is because of the sharpness of the Word of God. It delivers the perfect message at the right place, at the right time, in the perfect message, in the perfect way. That's how powerful God's Word is. A sword with two edges has no blunt edge. It cuts both this way and that. And that's the idea of God's Word. Oh, it is dangerous and it cuts all over. It cuts all over. It can pierce too. And that's the idea. While it has an edge like a sword, it also has a point like a rapier, piercing and dividing to soul and spirit. That's the only way you're going to get to the heart of some men and women is in the soul. Everything on the outside, they're too, their skin is too tough. Ah, but God's word can get right past that with no effort, just whoop, right in there. God's word and only God's word can penetrate the heart of natural man or woman, even to the division of soul and spirit. That is a powerful, powerful thing. We'll end there for tonight. Please pray with me. Father, as we talk about Christ and how he is greater, he is the greatest, you are the greatest, and your word is the greatest this last little portion that we were specifically talking about, just the power of your word and how it is alive. Let it be powerful and alive in our lives, our hearts and our minds this very moment and may it grow in power and influence over us, our hearts, our minds and our lives every moment of our lives. From this day forward, every day, may we grow in your word. And Lord, may we also be encouraged by the promise of your rest, that by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we are assured to be able to enter into that rest, to know that is of great confidence and courage to us. And now let us also have a sense of urgency in sharing that offer with those that you have put around us, the offer of your rest through faith and belief in Jesus Christ and the gospel that speaks of him. Help us to do all these things and help us to be more like Christ in whose name we pray. Amen.